Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, what's up, my friends? Today's episode, I'm joined by guest and friend, John Sarasani. John is a former Notre Dame football player who worked in corporate America until he decided to chase his own dreams. John's story is not that much different than many people's stories in that he found himself stuck, lost, and continually doing the same thing over and over again 
knowing that he could do it better if he invested in himself, if he took a risk, and if he saw what might happen. John is also the host of the 2000% Raise podcast, which I've been lucky enough to be a guest on in the past. In this conversation, John and I are going to go deep, talking about what it really means to step into the journey of creating change in your life when you know that you have to, when you that, know that you must, and most importantly, when you know and feel in your heart that you have some way inside of you to serve the world and yourself at a higher purpose. Today, not only is John the host of the 2000% Raise podcast, but he is also a venture capitalist and entrepreneur. And to be honest, I've learned a ton from John over the last few months. He has an incredible Instagram page that I highly recommend that you check out. And the 2000% Raise podcast is phenomenal, especially if you're trying to learn or understand business in a deeper way. Now, obviously, on Think Unbroken, we tend to stay in the mental health space. But I wanted John on this to have this conversation with me because I think it's really important for people to understand the possibility of betting on yourself. So I'm very excited for this episode, and without any further ado, my friends, John Sarasani. Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. I'm very excited to be back with you with another episode with my guest and friend, John Sarasani. John, my man, what is happening in your world today? Happy to be here, my friend. No, I've been looking forward to this all week, and uh, here we are. It's upon us. Yeah, dude, I've been pumped. You and I connected through a, a mutual amazing friend in David Meltzer, who for me, and I would assume for you as a, a bit of a mentor and a, a mensch, as we were talking about before the show. Um, but before we dive into all this, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. You got it. You got it, man. I grew up in a suburban Chicago. I uh, was a good football player. Ended up playing college football at uh, University of Notre Dame, played tight end there. Finished my career at Northwestern University and uh, injury um, stopped me from moving on to play in the NFL. So I was able to transfer my energy into uh, white collar America and all that competitive spirit from my football days. I um, transitioned into uh, doing well in a competitive environment in sales. Um, got into the insurance industry, started to prosper, and then a light bulb went off around about year six in that industry. Hey man, I could do this on my own. I don't need to be working here to do this. I'm going to go start my own company and compete with the likes of my employers. And uh, I did just that. Um, started it from my kitchen table, went after the same accounts that the big publicly traded companies were going after, people that have been established in the industry for years. And, uh, and, I, and I prospered. I won. I won more than I lost. And Got the attention of a private equity firm that bought my company less than 10 years later. And, uh, you know, the rest is kind of history. I was able to sail off into the sunset and came really from a middle class background and, um, you know, really changed, you know, my family's uh, lineage from a financial perspective for, for the you know, following generations as, as a result of the story I just told you. Um, Michael, I, try, I try, tried to retire, my friend and uh, do nothing, what I decided was I definitely wasn't going to be going back into insurance. I knew that much. But, um, you know, we only got one life to live. So I decided I'm going to be a venture capitalist. I always have kind of dabbled with angel investing and, um, you know, just unique alternative investments like bars or restaurants or invested in a musical world. It's kind of fun. And, um, you know, hey, why, why, not, uh, why not bring some capital to, um, to that community that, that needs it, and uh, also some advisement as well. Decided I'm going to found Gwen Crutch Global, which is my uh, early stage venture capital firm. And our thesis is simple. <laughs> if I think it's cool or interesting, uh, I have a lot on uh, me partnering with you. If, if I think it's boring or dull, hey man, insurance was lucrative for me, dude, but. Uh, not the most exciting dinner conversation. So this next chapter of my life, I really want to get into things that are that are fun. And I've been doing that for a few years now. And uh, I, I could tell you, I've I've accomplished I've accomplished that part of it. Now, whether these investments pay off or not, Michael, uh, uh, that's to be determined because we are early stage. It takes a while for them to come to fruition. But I'm definitely involved in some cool that that is for sure. 
Yeah, that's awesome, dude. And, you know, I think about anything that we invest in, I mean, the, the ROI on experience alone is typically worth it, right? I, you know, it's funny because we get so caught up in, in the money side of what it means to become the people that we're supposed to be. And much like you, what's really interesting, man, is I, I landed a job with a Fortune 10 insurance company at 20 years old. Wow. And, and by the time that I was 26, I had made almost a million bucks. 50 grand in debt, 350 pounds. Like I've, I've said it ad nauseum on this show. But one of the things that I, I realized is I was driven to money for the wrong reasons. Like I had this idea and this notion like, oh yeah, when I get financial success, everything will be better. And then I actually learned like, that's not how life works. Money only tends to bring out more of who you are in the time that you are that. And so what I'm curious about is now that you're, you're pivoting and you're looking at impacting the world for better. And, and I want to start here because I think it's important. I think a lot of people have a, a really misconstrued relationship with money, right? We look at it and we say, oh, I don't have enough or I can't get enough or this or that. But you were able to sell a company. Yep. I would have to imagine that your relationship with money changed from I'm going to do this on my own from my kitchen table, making zero dollars because that's where all entrepreneurs start to selling it. And I'd love for you to talk about that journey, especially with losing out on the NFL. I don't want to use losing out, but you know what I mean. Right, right. Well, it was an interesting time, man. It was an interesting time because I was definitely you know, and I'm not just saying this, anybody that played with me or, or followed my career closely back then would, would know that I was good enough to play in the NFL. An injury just stopped me from doing it. And I wasn't going to be, you know, Peyton Manning or something, but I definitely would have been like a fourth or fifth round draft pick and definitely would have bounced around in the league for a couple of years. So, you know, during this time while I was working in insurance, you know, I worked at a company called Arthur J. Gallagher, which is an insurance giant, big, they're based out of Chicago, but they're an international company. And I'm learning the trade and my career started to blossom, but every Sunday I'm watching TV and I'm seeing guys that I played against or guys that I played with, um, that I was just as good as, uh, you know, getting that fame playing on the Cowboys or the bears or the, you know, whomever. Um, and, and for a little part of me, ah, oh man, I should, I should have just played and ignored this injury and, you know, but it ended up being a huge blessing in disguise, Michael, because, by the time we were 30, nobody was playing football anymore. Now, now, granted, I played against Tom Brady, actually. We're about the same age. We, he played at Michigan when I was at Northwestern. We played against each other. He's still playing, so that, that's the anomaly, right? But, but, but for the most part, and, and the category I would have been in for almost certainly, is by the time you're 30, your career's over. <laughs> you ain't playing anymore. So, so, you know, what was I doing when I was 30? I was two years into this company I was building. I was two years into this empire I was building. Whereas a lot of my friends were getting entry level jobs entering the real world. Now, yeah, some of them had a million dollar nest egg behind it because they were able to be smart enough to save some money in the NFL, but a lot of them didn't. A lot of them barely, you know, were able to scrap anything together. So, so from that regard, you know, um, the NFL part of your question is, yeah, it, it, it was almost a paradigm shift, man. And, and I, I you know, it ended up really being a blessing. And, and um, you know, that, that's just the way it was. It wasn't until I was 40 that I started kind of wishing I played again. You know what I mean? <laughs> Get that midlife crisis. Um, but but at, the, at the time, I kind of knew it for what it was. And, uh, you know, because another thing with the NFL, man, these guys, I, I had a friend of mine played on the Rams, but those contracts suck. You get caught, you're off the team, you're on injured reserve. He had to work construction jobs in the offseason to pay the bills. He didn't know what team he was going to be on. And he was a good football player, man. That is, you talk about a competitive industry. I mean, that, that, I, that's as competitive as it gets, bro. Um, so, so I talked earlier about, you know, transferring that energy to, to my career. And I continued to do that once, once I started my company and, the, you know, it really just kept hockey sticking, you know, almost immediately and, and, just, and just kept going up. And I really had no intention of ever selling the company, Michael. Um, it was, you know, it was just doing great. And, um, you know, private equity got into that space and really changed the game. Had private equity not entered that insurance space, I probably never would have sold it. Um, it did put me in a position, though, to, you know, 
reevaluate what we're here on this planet for. Hey, man, listen, <laughs> they're going to pay you what it's going to take you about the next 15 years to make with this private equity firm coming in. You, man, you don't got to work the 15 years. <laughs> so you're going to be set for life here. You don't have to do, um, okay, well, what am I going to do with my life then? And um, it was that reevaluation that uh, I think really was a pivotal time for me, my friend. When, when you have that, you know, I, I think, and I look back, I'm, I'm at this company, I'm 26 mm -hmm. on paper. Life looks amazing. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm clearing an ungodly amount of money for a kid from the hood with no education. Right. Right. And it's like, looks good, dude. Cars dope. Clothes are dope. Life is, but in reality, like my life is a disaster. Mm. And, and I had this pivotal moment where I had to make a decision where I was like, okay, what do you really want? Who do you really want to be? And what are you willing to do to get there? And, and I think that a lot of that for me came in this space of recognizing what you just said is like, life is short. Yeah. Like there is a timeline on this. And, and there is something about the risk that we take that I believe is the cornerstone to our life transforming. And so I'm in this job, I'm making this money, I'm looking at my life and I'm in debt at this point. And I, I was like, you know what? I hate my life. I hate wearing khakis to work every day. This is nonsense, this is not who I am. Sure. And I hate water cooler talk and being nice to people for no reason. Not that you shouldn't be nice to people, but you know, water cooler talk. I'm like, I can't stand this. Right. And so I quit. And a woman and I started my first legal business. Let's be clear, it was legal at this time. And so <laughs> what happened was it took me from struggling, not making any money to I actually paid off that debt within three years. Because I was like, I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to see what happens. And so I'm wondering, when you're in this position of you're working at this insurance company, you realize you have the light bulb moment and you decide to take the risk, why? Because so many people, they're like, man, I know I can do this better. I know I can create this. I know I can have this life. But they're terrified to do the thing. So what transpired for you, John, where you're like, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to yeah. see what happens. Yeah. Well, what was interesting was, you know, you, you get brainwashed, I believe, in corporate America. And, and you start drinking the Kool-Aid and you keep drinking it. And, and you look for outlets, okay, of, wait a minute, this don't seem right. But the only people you have to ask or to reflect on this with are other people that have been drinking the same Kool-Aid as you. And when you're 25, you got 40-year-olds next to you or 50-year-olds next to you that have been drinking it longer than you. So, eh, yeah, should we just, like, we can do this shit on our own. Should we go start our own company? No, you'll never get any clients. Eh. Mm -hmm. Well, they have to give you that advice. Because if they didn't, they'd be admitting that they screwed up. Oh, you know what, John? Yeah, you know what? You should go quit this job that I've been at for 20 years. And you should go make triple what I make because I'm a dumb and was scared to do it. No, like even if they, you know, e even if they were nice enough person to tell you that, they don't see it that way. It's not like they're holding back because they want, hey, screw you. I don't want, it's not an ego thing. They literally don't see it that way so i would start peeling back the onion wait a minute guys wait a minute uh i don't even hand off half the shit i do to the account management team because i know they're not going to do it as well as i do they're not responding to emails for two days because they're taking two hour freaking lunches when i'm replying at 9 p.m on a friday night uh i'm going to visit clients in person driving two hours they're looking for every reason in the world they can to let's make it a phone conference because we didn't do Zoom back then, right? And, and I'm just thinking to myself, you know what? Why am I adapting to this environment that's going to bring my standard down? Mm. So I got all these people around me trying to convince me, no, man, the client's going to want this company. We've been in business for 100 years. We got 20,000 employees. You know, that, you, you, no client's going to work with you. You'd have to go downstream, which maybe work with like tiny little employers, like maybe hair salons. No, man, I'm going to work with the same clients, okay, that, that I'm working with there. Well, they'll never work with you. Why? It's about the client deliverable. The client deliverable that they're getting right now with me working here, <laughs> 19,999 of these employees on my team don't do 
on your account. Okay. And guess what? They don't have a hundred years of experience. They have six years of experience. That's me. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so if, if I could leave and get clients to see it that way, okay, I'm going to be able to bring a better deliverable to the client. You know why? Because in this environment in corporate America, they're incenting me with money. They're incenting me with commission. I got to just put more and more volume stretch myself okay maybe i'm gonna make a quarter million dollars one day. yeah let's go i would have had to stretch myself with so many clients to get there that innately they're gonna get a version of john as a result of that and i would have to scale because of that environment that's been created in corporate america i would have to scale and give them some of these deliverables to someone that's not going to do it as well as me so why don't i go start my own company I could replace that 250 grand I was making there just by having a fraction of those clients. You follow me? And then as I do scale, which I eventually did, there's going to be quality control components on the way there. That person going for a two hour launch or that person, you know, that gets an email at 6 p.m. on Thursday and then replies at 11 a.m. Monday to a client, letting them know that they're looking into it. Yeah, that person ain't going to work for me. Okay. You know what I mean? So, so, so I found a way that I could have a huge financial gain for myself and give a better service to the client. And you know what's crazy about it, man? The two things will go hand in freaking hand. You know what I mean? The client, the client see it this way, and, you know, I, I will be rewarded. So, um, you know, that, that's the way it went down, man. And, uh, you know, it, it, it worked out. It was uh, it's hard getting those first few in, but, but once we got rolling, we got rolling. Yeah. And, and it's always difficult at the beginning because I think people believe that when they go and create something that suddenly it'll just work and yeah. it, nothing ever works. So like I think about this podcast, for instance, right. you know, we're, we're over 500 shows. We've interviewed some of the greatest minds on planet earth. We've been able to build giant conferences and events with thousands of people. We've coached thousands of people in our community coaching programs, mm -hmm. all of those things. But man, I'll tell you what, at the beginning, nobody listened. <laughs> right. You know, the, the first month, I'll never forget this. The first month we did 19 downloads for the whole month, the first month, 19 downloads. 12 of those were for sure me, mm -hmm. right? listening cue it did it good was that good did i was the audio suck did i say the wrong thing blah blah blah. and and today i mean we'll do a million downloads this year wow that's and, and so and so much of it is perseverance it's yeah. being persistent it's following your dream because john i guarantee i do not even have to know exactly what happened and i can look at this story i go there were people who told you not to do this oh yeah oh yeah for sure and the reality is there always are going to be people who tell you, do not follow your dream. Mm -hmm. Don't do that thing. How do you do it anyway, John? Because there are people right now and they're like, man, I got this dream, not even about entrepreneurship or money, but you know, I want to go do a dance class or I want to go do jujitsu or Muay Thai. And they're just like terrified to just follow the thing that is going to bring them joy. Like, yeah. How do you do it anyway, John? Yeah. Well, for me, from a business standpoint, I, I had, it was a calculated risk because I was really able to learn the industry and look everything, look through everything inside and out, inside and out. And, you know, even though people were telling me I'm crazy, uh, I was able to do freaking math. Hey, guess what? I didn't need every single client. I didn't need every client to say yes. I needed about a third of them to say yes. I, I don't need to sell as much as I did over there to make this thing work. And, and uh, you know, and, and that and that and that it did. But. But really what I, what I discovered, Michael, I think is where, really where more were your questions going, you know, it wasn't just the financial rewards. It was the, the building of, of my entrepreneurial spirit. So what, what it gave me was this freedom to understand, holy crap, man, you could do this. I always had that entrepreneurial spirit in me, but it wasn't even like on the radar to do this as an adult with an insurance company. Are you crazy? This was for like when I was in college with side hustles. Yeah. I had a concert pr company, a promotion company and like that. These were John Sarasani side hustles that, yeah, man, you can do that. But like to do it in the real world, competing against people with, that are smart. I mean, whoa, 
So, so, you know, um, you know, I discovered that when maybe I did it firstly for, for the, you know, financial upside, um, I, I discovered like, okay, you know what, this is me, man, th th this is me. Um, you know, and I, and I think if anyone identifies something in their life, you know, where, gosh, you know, like the examples you just gave a, a hobby or, or, you know, whatever, maybe it's going and finding somebody that you haven't talked to in 20 years and, and getting the courage to, you know, the courage to do that, whatever the case may be, you know, it, you know, in, instead of why, you know, why not, why not? Like, like what, if, what is the downside here? You know what I mean? If you go practice jujitsu or, or like, I see guys at my gym, Michael doing Muay Thai. And I'm like, uh, I won't make it through freaking warm up so much. Okay. I'm not flexible enough, but you know what, man, if I wanted to go do freaking Muay Thai, what's the downside? You know what I mean? <laughs> like go try it. Didn't work out. It didn't freaking work out. You know, I, I think we live in, um, you know, in a, in a society right now, at least that that's a lot more welcoming than it was maybe 25 years ago in terms of encouraging people to, 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 to do things. Um, I have a 14 year old son and I had a conversation with him the other day, his, uh, yeah, I won't get specific, but there was a, a kid that's maybe like, you know, special needs in one of his classes. And, um, they asked him to be in his group, pick, like handpicked my son and another kid to be in his group for, um, you know, to just include him in this study group because nobody probably would have included the kid or the teacher was worried about that. The kid didn't have any friends in the class. And I said, but you know, that's a big compliment, Jake. And he didn't really understand why that was a compliment. And the kind of was asking me, well, what do you mean? That's a compliment. I go, the teacher picked you to, that she sees something in you that you would be, and he didn't understand it. And I said, and he's 14, he's not like a little kid. He really didn't understand it. And I said to him, um, you know, because maybe there's, you know, kids that would have picked on them or made fun of them or whatever, or just not done that. And he goes, Dad, it's 2022. Nobody makes fun of kids like that anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I I'm glad he sees it that way. I don't know if he's 100% accurate or not, but it was kind of like a, a proud moment. I, I, I went from, I went from thinking my son didn't get it to, no, I, I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was kind of cool, cool moment, but. Yeah, so that's a long way to answer your question there, buddy. No, that's that's an interesting thought, man. And I, I think you're right. And we do live in a world that is not only more accommodating, but also when you are in the, and, and I'll say this, because I think there's a caveat to it. When you are around the right people, they will want you to be successful. Yep. And when I think about my group of friends, my peers, my mentors, people like you where I meet, and it's like we're in this same room for a reason. Like, yep. dude, I want you to succeed. I want you to have great things. You want that of me. When you're in the wrong scenarios and in the wrong friendships and the wrong communities, people are going to want to pull you down. They're going to want to be like, hey, man, you better not do that. Or, hey, I tried this. It didn't work or this or that. And, and I think that that's one of the really interesting dichotomies of the time that we live. Because on this one hand, yeah, you for sure have so much opportunity and so much potential in front of you. Yep. And on the other hand, it's like, if you are around the wrong people, you will never see it come to fruition because they're always going to be in your ear. Yeah. And I think the most important thing that you can do is to do it anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, what is the worst that could happen? I mean, if you play it through, what's the worst that could happen if you tried to play football? You'll get an injury. What's the worst that could happen if you start a business? You might go bankrupt. What's the worst that could happen if you do whatever? Then it's like, but then at some point on the timeline, the worst thing that could happen to you already happened. So you might as well try. Yep. When you think about the future, when you think about your life and, and what is important, what do you think are the, mo the most life-changing lessons that you've learned in your willingness to bet on yourself? Mm, interesting. Um, there's a couple things that come to mind, really. I had a... Uh... I had a coach in college that ingrained, um, you know, and it's, it's a little bit cliche, but it resonated with me and I reflect on it from time to time. He said, don't point the finger, point the thumb. And, and his point with that, he was talking specifically to me too. We had a couple, couple of, let's say, episodes of adversity in college. And, he, and uh, <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. And, and he said, no, John, 
you know, it's not like you keep defending yourself. Well, this keeps coming up. At some point, you got to look in the mirror, start pointing the thumb instead of the point of the finger. You know, you hear this once, you hear it twice. Guess what? You got to start looking in the mirror at yourself. Um, so I think that was kind of a moment in my life where I looked at, hey, just kind of take a bull by the horns here, man. It, it's so easy for all of us, right? It's so easy for all of us to blame our circumstances on other people. It, it's, it's so easy to be, to be pissed at the world. And, and, and even on a micro level, like, you know, you, you hear stories like yours, Michael, or, or, or you hear stories not even nearly as great as yours, but like a story like mine where I'm overcoming, okay, I thought I was going to play in the NFL. Now I don't. Oh, I got to get a job. Okay, that's like a challenging time in your life. But like to do something positive and not blame anyone like in the smaller facets, the big ones like that, okay, let's draw attention to that. But like, I don't know, man. I, I don't like being around people that are, are constantly just like, blaming everyone for their freaking situation you know what i mean like um you know i don't freaking like oh, i was at this party and uh, i freaking spilled wine all over this white couch well they shouldn't have been serving red wine at their party with a white car yeah. many people you know what i mean yeah. like, real though people would not rethink totally it. you know what i mean i'm at a freaking party the other freaking day it was my friends i'm not going to be specific but it was a surprise party and it's so <laughs> that it was in their clubhouse instead of at like a bar and like, why would they do it here this i don't know anybody and what did you shut up God, shut up you know what i mean it's just like you know I, I try my best to avoid stuff like that um you know sometimes i'll find myself being in the middle of that too and I, I, it's, uh, I'll, I'll try to have that self-awareness wait a minute i'm participating in this pull yourself out <laughs> you know what i mean yeah uh, so that's an interesting point. I, I think you're spot on, man, because it's, it's self-accountability. Oh. And I, I think that's a great lesson to learn, especially young while you're in college, but probably at any time because yeah. there, there is truth. I mean, yeah, man, like life is hard sometimes. Yeah. Like life will kick you while you are down and it will rain on your parade and it will feel insurmountable. Yeah. But what's interesting is like, I'll rewind some scenarios. Mm -hmm. I'll look at what is happening. I'll just sit back and I'll pause with it. Right. And I'll just ask myself, what is actually happening right now? Right. Is this as bad as I'm portraying it to be? Did I play a role in this? John, 99% of the time I did. And right. then, and then what can I do about it? Yeah. What can I do about it? And I think accountability is such an important lesson in life because it, it pointing the finger is so simple. Right. You lose accountability. Oh, it's m your fault that my life is terrible. It's their fault that nothing is worry working for me. It's everyone else but me. Yeah. But I think that's a, when you get to that place of, wait a second, I play a role in this too. Mm. It's kind of like a baseball bat to the face. Right. Because if you're anything like how I was when I recognized this at 26 years old, I was like, oh, I play a role in my life as well. Yeah. Yep. And I, I got to tell you, man, even to this day, because I'll have peers, bro, that <laughs> that I came up with in the insurance industry, bringing this back to business a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll peers that are doing the exact same job that I quit. OK, but, you know, they'll give you kind of that backhanded compliment here and there. You're kind of kind of kind of lucky how that unfolded. Congratulations, dude. You got so lucky with how that did. And just kind of throwing like a little jab like you didn't No, dude. You know what? I was pointing the freaking thumb instead of the finger. And, and I was at work till 8 p.m. Oh, we weren't allowed to bring laptops home back then. And you know what I would do? I'd go into the office on Saturday morning and then go back at 4 p.m. on Saturday to check to see if anyone responded to the damn emails because we wouldn't have Blackberries yet. Okay, that's the shit I was doing. What were you doing? You know what I mean? So, like that mindset where, you know, it, it has a positive connotation too. You know, yeah, get rid of the negativity. But also put it on yourself, okay, what have you been successful with because you've taken the bull by the horns and done this on your own? And, um, you know, it, it, it comes to fruition for me. I don't say it out loud to the people, but I'll have people, like, like I just said, you know, give me those kind of backhanded compliments. And it's like, okay, yeah, dude, <laughs> re re 
Remember when uh, you were leaving work at 4.30 on Fridays? Yeah, I, I wasn't. I keep that to myself, though. Yeah, there there is some level to that. You used uh, a phrase stretching yourself a little bit ago. Yeah. And and there's truth in that. You know, when I, I think about what what I see myself accomplish, what our coaching clients and, and our coaching programs accomplish, and it's so many of these people are just willing to go the next level, go the extra mile, do the thing that sucks. Because like a lot of them, it sucks, man. It sucks to wake up and meditate and journal and to do the som somatic things that you need to do to get inside of your body. Yep. It sucks to work on programs and events at 10 o'clock at night. But, you know, also at the same time, it's like, what is your goal? What is your perfect? What are you trying to accomplish? Yep. When, when you look at your life and what is next, one of the things that I think about for myself is like, I know I can't get to where I want to go without mentorship and coaching. Okay. And so I'm curious for you, what role does that play in your life? And is it helping you go to where you believe that you want to go in the future? You know, that's a great question. And it's something I need to explore further, further than, um, you know, I, I have, I, I have not gone that direction at all. I've, I've actually gone this other direction where I've, I've asked people to be a mentor. People have asked me to be a mentor for, for them, usually from a business standpoint, um, but uh, I, I haven't leaned on other people. Now, what I have done is drawn on experiences that I've, that I've tried to learn from. Um, and I've tried to take, it, take into account the principles we talked about earlier, like, you know, not, not blaming other people for things happening. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick for instance. All right. Oh, you know, that's my second cousin. Oh, I, we only see them at weddings and funerals and, oh, whatever. Well, have, have you invited them to dinner? They haven't invited you to dinner either. Have, well, when, when have you invited them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like take that kind of role. Hey, this is family. This is someone that's important to me. Um, so, you know, one of the things I've started doing in 2022 is that on the first of each month, I have a list of, of, um, of um, things I want to make sure I can accomplish that month. And some are business related, some are personal related, um, some are health and wellness related. And um, a couple of them involve reaching out to people that I haven't spoken to in a while, someone that had some kind of significant impact on my life. And it could be a colleague, a business associate. Um, and it, it, there's one category, another category is family. Um, I keep myself fresh, Michael, in, in those kinds of conversations where, okay, you know what? I do remember now why this guy was such a significant part of my life from 2007 to 2012. Okay having this two hour conversation with him, even though we haven't talked to each other other than LinkedIn and Facebook posts for the last 12 years, you know what, that memory, I remember, yeah, oh God, that was good. Those experiences were great. Okay. Am I still that person? Have I drawn on any of that for, you know, this next phase of my life that I'm, that I'm in right now? Um, so I, I do feel like I have growth from, from things like that. Uh, but, but I have not, I have not, uh, prospered at this point from, um, from a coaching or mentorship standpoint. Yeah. But it, it sounds like you have, but maybe not in such a direct way. Right. Yeah. Cause we're always, we're always learning, right. We're always, you know, there in the insurance thing, there must've been people who helped and guided you just in the context of what you were in. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is what not to follow me. This is what not to do. That's kind of how yeah. they guided me. But anyway. Well, but still, I, that plays a huge role because I've seen that in, in my own personal life and journey and in the way that I coach people and in the way that we've been able to build Think Unbroken. And it's a lot of that is like I've looked at what I really hate in personal development. Mm. And I said, I'm going to do the opposite of that. Okay. I'm going to bring value. We're going to help people. We're going to not charge $10 million for you to come to a program or a course, right? We're going to make it accessible. And so I think there is a, a lot to that, like learning through what other people either don't do or you believe they've done incredibly wrong, which I think is, it's just a part of assessing reality, right? And looking at it. You know, what's really interesting about you saying that. So over the last probably year and a half, I, I just started building up my social media following and I put out like business related reels and TikToks and you know, it's been, and, I, and I've had a number of people just send me messages telling me that I'm different than everyone else doing what they're, what I'm doing. And everyone kind of just assumes I'm selling some kind of program or whatever. And I'm not, I'm just genuinely doing this stuff as, 
you know, as, uh, as information for the masses. And I find it entertaining and it's fun for, for me to do. But, um, you know, I, I think, it, and then as I've looked at growing that more seriously and maybe making a business out of it, Michael, um, what's the first thing I do? Start looking at what everyone else is doing. The people that are successful in that space is doing when I have people drawn to me already that are liking me because I don't do what everyone else is doing. You know what I mean? So it's kind of that conundrum, right? Yeah. No, it is. And I, I think there's, there's some arenas in which you definitely want to model, right? And there's some spaces where you have to be you. You know, and I, I think the personality, especially if we go down the social media path, tends to shine through more because, you know, there's many people are carbon copies of each other. You know, when you look at it, you can see it. And as people become more aware and they really understand how social media works, it, it becomes more and more clear to them. At least it comes more and more clear to me where I'm like, oh, this person's putting on a front. They're not really about whatever they're talking about. And I think that just comes with the territory of it all. You know, and I, I think that if you continue to put yourself out there because of what you want, I love that you said that it's because it's fun and because it's enjoyable because I want to do it. Right. It's like, dude, if we could give people a magic pill to have that experience, my God, how their lives would be different. Right, right, exactly. And I, I think it shines through, right? Like it just people, because you see that it's genuine. You see that it's genuine. And uh, so I got that going for me at the moment. What, what I'm going to do with this information, I'm not sure of, but, but uh, I, I can say that I am being sincere in anything I put out there. Yeah, and I, I definitely watch a lot of what you put out there. And I think to myself, man, he's, he's putting out some good stuff. So people should definitely check it out. Jen, my friend, that's been an amazing conversation, brother. Before I ask you my last question, yep. please tell everyone where they can find you. So my podcast webpage and also my book will be coming out 2000percentraise.com. But uh, in the meantime, social media, uh, TikTok and Instagram is at John Sarasani. That's C-E-R-A-S-A-N-I. Brilliant, my friend. Of course, we'll put the links in the notes for all of the listeners. My last question for you, my friend. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? See, here's what I love about that question. I've watched your show. I know you're going to ask me it. And, and I still don't have a great answer. And the reason I, it's not that I don't have an answer. It's like I have 50 answers. I have 50 great answers. You know what I mean? That's such a provocative question, Michael. Um, and I love that you end your show with it better than how I end my show asking people what their favorite movie is. <laughs> um, what does it mean to me to be unbroken? I, I, I would say that um, the overcoming overcoming of of adversity, whether big or whether small, nothing's ever as bad as it seems. Usually, things aren't as great as they as they seem. Um, keeping an even keel. Tomorrow's always, always a new day. Mm, yeah. Brilliantly said, man. I, I totally agree. The meaning we make of our experiences is truly everything. Thank you so much for being here. Unbroken Nation, thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review, and you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends, and until next time, be unbroken. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me 
and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.